our friends are stirring. The Scottish drums had begun to beat, and all along the enemy's line, men were hitching up shields, dropping visors, or hefting swords. They could see that the English had brought their horses closer, presumably to aid their retreat, and that the enemy line was apparently stripped of half its archers, so they must have believed that those bowmen were perilously short of missiles. Yet the Scots still chose to advance on foot, knowing that even a handful of arrows could madden their horses and throw a mounted charge into chaos. They shouted as they advanced, as much to harden themselves as put fear in the English, but they became more confident when they reached the place where the bodies lay from their last charge, and still no arrows flew. Not yet, lads, not yet! Lord Outhwaite had taken command of the archers on the right wing. The Lords Percy and Neville commanded here, yet both were content to allow the older man give orders to the bowmen. They waited with their men-at-arms. Lord Arthway glanced constantly across the field to where the Scots advanced on the English left wing, where his own men were, but he was satisfied that the hollow of ground would go on protecting them, just as the stone wall shielded the centre. It was here on the side of the ridge closest to Durham, where the Scots were strongest and the English most vulnerable. Let them get closer, he warned the archers. We want to finish them off once and for all, poor fellows. He began tapping his fingers on his saddle's pommel, keeping time with the few remaining big Scottish drums and waiting until the front rank of Scots was only a hundred paces away. Foremost archers, he called when he judged the enemy was close enough. That's you fellows in front of the line. Start shooting. About half the archers were in plain sight in the army's front, and they now drew their bows, cocked the arrows up into the air and loosed. The Scots, seeing the volley coming to run, hoping to close the range quickly so that only a handful of the arrows would hurt. All archers! Lord Arthwaite boomed, fearing he had waited too long, and the archers, who had been concealed behind the men-at-arms, began to shoot over the heads of the troops in front. The Scots were close now, close enough so that even the worst archer could not fail to hit his mark, so close that the arrows were again piercing through mail and bodies and strewing the ground with more wounded and dying men. Thomas could hear the arrows striking home. Some clanged off armor, some thumped into shields, but many made a sound like a butcher's axe when it slaughtered cattle at winter's coming. He aimed at a big man whose visor was raised and sent an arrow down his throat. Another arrow into a tribesman whose face was contorted with hate. Then an arrow's knock split on him, spinning the broken missile away when he released the string. He plucked the feathered scraps from the string, took a new arrow and drove it into another bearded tribesman who was all fute hair. A mounted Scotsman was encouraging his men forward, and then he was flailing in the saddle, struck by three arrows, and Thomas loosed another shaft, striking a man-at-arms clean in the chest so that the point ripped through mail, leather, bone and flesh. His next arrow sank into a shield. The Scots were floundering, trying to force themselves into the reign of death. Steady, boys, steady! An archer called to his fellows, fearing they were snatching at the strings and thus not using the full force of their bows. Keep shooting! Lord Arthway called. His fingers still tapped the pommel of his saddle, though the Scottish drums were faltering. Lovely work! Lovely work! Horses! Lord Percy ordered. He could see that the Scots were on the edge of despair, but the English archers were not, after all, short of arrows. Horses! He bellowed again and his men-at-arms ran back to haul themselves into saddles. Pages and squires handed up the big heavy lot as men fiddled armored feet into stirrups, glanced at the suffering enemy, and then snapped down their visors. Shoot! Shoot! Lord Arthway called. That's the way, lads! The arrows were pitiless. The Scottish wounded cried to God, called for their mothers, and still the feathered death hammered home. One man, wearing the lion of Stuart, spewed a pink mist of blood and spittle. He was on his knees, but managed to stand, took a step, fell to his knees again, shuffled forward, blew more blood-stained bubbles, and then an arrow buried itself in his eye and went through his brain to scrape against the back of his skull, and he went backwards as though hit by a thunderbolt. Then the great horses came. For England, Edward and St. George, Lord Percy called and a trumpeter took up the challenge as the great destriers charged. They unceremoniously thrust the archers aside as the lances dropped. The turf shook. Only a few horsemen were attacking, 
after the shock of their charge struck the enemy with stunning force and the Scots reeled back. Lances were relinquished in men's bodies as the knights drew swords and hacked down at frightened, cowering men who could not run because the press of bodies was too great. More horsemen were mounting up, and those men-at-arms who did not want to wait for their stallions were running forward to join the carnage. The archers joined them, drawing swords or swinging axes. The drums were at last silent, and the slaughter had begun. Thomas had seen it happen before. He had seen how, in an eye blink, a battle could change. The Scots had been pressing all day. They had so nearly shattered the English. They were rampant and winning. Yet now they were beaten, and the men of the Scottish left, who had come so close to giving their king his victory, were the ones who broke. The English war horses galloped into their ranks to make bloody lanes, and there were swung swords, axes, clubs and warning stars and panicked men. The English archers joined in, mobbing the slower Scots like packs of hounds leaping onto deer. Prisoners! Lord Percy shouted at his retainers. I want prisoners! A Scotsman swung an axe at his horse, missed and was chopped down by his lordship's sword. An archer finished the job with a knife and then slit the man's padded jerkin to search for coins. Two carpenters from Durham hacked with woodworker's adzes at a struggling man-at-arms, bludgeoning his skull, killing him slowly. An archer reeled back, gasping, his belly cut open, and a Scot followed him, screaming in rage, but then was tripped by a bow stave and went down under a swarm of men.